All right, it's a, another film study. This is week, week eight, looking at the offense as the Ravens lost to the Steelers. Of course, it's a weird week, so we've got some stuff to look ahead to as well today. Ken McCusick, how you doing? Life's good, Josh. How about you? I, I'm doing good. I'm, I'm watching the TV. I'm waiting for those the, uh, the results of that Gold Glove elect, uh, announcement tonight. <laughs> you know, isn't that what everyone's watching CNN yes, and yes. Uh, Fox News and everything for? Very good. <laughs> to, to see if uh, Santander can, can win a gold glove. So uh, joining us as our guest tonight is Voss from the Baltimore Beatdown. Voss, how's it going? Doing fine. Doing fine. Thanks for having me, guys. Always a pleasure, Voss. Uh, uh, let's throw it out there generally. What did this game tell us about the Ravens? Or do we want to talk about COVID first? Maybe we talk about that before we get into this game a little bit since this is yeah, co- incredible COVID. dark cloud. Yeah, COVID's the big news of today, of yesterday that then became even bigger news today. So let's go there, and then we'll look backwards. Okay, so just to, to anybody who's been in a cave, whatnot, I'm sure you've probably heard this by now on Wednesday, but uh, Mar- Marlon Humphrey, of course, tested positive for COVID yesterday, and today his close contacts were all put in a protocol where they will have to be isolated for five days. They could potentially play on Sunday, but they can't practice this week. Uh, and they would have to, of course, uh, test negative. But that included Patrick Queen, uh, Harrison, and Fort. So three inside linebackers gone. Elliott, the only free safety they have. And Judon Bowser, the only Sam linebackers they have. And Terrell Bonds uh, as well. Uh, they can't practice again, and they can play Sunday. Voss, what do you, what do you make of this? Well, it's a huge storyline. Five starters, three contributors. You have to wonder if Humphrey – had maybe contracted but was not testing positive when he missed practice last week. Uh, it's it's obviously a, a big, huge concern with a big game on tap with playoff implications in Indy. Can, are these are these uh, players going to be able to play? Um, you have to figure it's spread at some point in the locker room, potentially, at least with the contact tracing, or can they maybe push the game back to Tuesday as they have done or maybe tack on – uh, week 18 to the end of the season because I don't see how the Ravens can really feel a competitive unit missing five or six starters on defense. Right. I, I agree. I think the NFL will probably do something in terms of deferring the game to give every opportunity for non-positive players to play would be my guess. I don't know if they'll defer the game, but if they ended up with a bunch of positive tests out of this group, I would think they'd have to they'd have to basically play this game at the end of the season and not not do it now. But we'll see how it works out. Uh, you know, obviously this would be a very difficult win. We're here to talk about the off- offense tonight. This is really a defensive matter. Before we get into the offense, though, Josh has got a, a new sponsor for us that we want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, same, a new sponsor that we've been talking about for two weeks now, or a week and a half, and it's my bookie. Now, you guys are a little too late to hop on the election odds, I believe so. Maybe not. I mean, you can, they, they usually deal out a few days, so you might be able to get in there. They, they but, deal an in-game line today, usually, so they, they have something going on on the election right now. Yeah, yeah, but I'm assuming you're listening to this on Wednesday morning. Odds are might not be as good as they are right now, <laughs> as they are changing every couple minutes if you're keeping your eye on it. But mybookie.ag, for all the NFL, college games, and uh, social and political events, uh, some fights coming up at the end of November is that Tyson fight, all that type of stuff. You can go on over to my bookie and bet on it. If you're the type of guy who likes to back the big favorites, consider putting a couple of them into a parlay in order to get a much bigger payout. Not only do parlays make meaningless games exciting, but more importantly, they give you a chance to turn ordinary bets into real money maker. Plus, don't forget the underdogs. Think of how much money you could have made if you took the points for the Giants yesterday. Because the odd makers did not see that coming. So go on over to mybookie.ag and use the code RAVENS, and they will match your deposit dollar for dollar to give you some free money to play with. So that's the code RAVENS over at mybookie.ag. Really impressive one for one match up to a thousand bucks. That's the kind of. Uh, you know, advantage money you look for if you're uh, if you're trying to make some money at this game. So I, I think that, uh, you know, it sounds like a pretty good offer in those terms. There is a rollover requirement. I'll let you look that up. But uh, uh, anyway, that's a or or be like me and don't try to make money from my bookie. 
just try to make your deposit last for a few weeks or the <laughs> season and to just add a little bit more enjoy, enjoyment when you have to watch a Jets game or a Giants game because <laughs> it's the only thing that's on TV. Fair enough. Fair enough. All, All right, right let's, let's, let's look back. Let's, let's talk offense. I, I like to start each show with the offensive line scoring. So, Voss, I'm going to go through this, and, and I, I want you to comment on each player as you feel uh, you'd, you'd like to. But we'll start with Ronnie Stanley, obviously the un- unfortunate story from this game uh 20 snaps in the game he missed two blocks had a half a pressure given up he also was flagged for illegal formation which frankly i think they could call on just about every play the way he stands up in his stance uh but uh, a c after adjustment in what is going to be his final game of 2020 very difficult very difficult obviously one of the two or three best players on the team to go down in that fashion see him breathing in pain on the ground there especially right after, I guess in in his case, he was fortunate, right after he just signed the contract extension. The Ravens have been snake-bitten to some extent with the early contract extensions. Ronnie Stanley, Tavon Young, Darius Webb a few years back. Dennis Pitta. Dennis, well, I think Pitta actually broke his hip before the contract the first time, Um, but we can look that up. I think that happened afterwards. Mm. Uh, But uh, it's just a very tough blow for the Ravens. Obviously, the offensive line has been a point of concern all season after Marshall Yana's retirement and losing their best offensive lineman. There's no way around it. It's going to hurt. Yeah, it it is going to hurt. And we didn't really see it in this game, as we'll get to it, because Brown and Fluker both played very well, particularly in their new spots at left tackle and right tackle. Get to that in just a moment. Bradley Bozeman is the next player I'm going to go through. 78 snaps, played them all, missed six blocks. Uh, allowed half a quarterback hit and one pressure. That's outstanding, given that's all his negative events. Uh, He was up against Cam Hayward for most of the day. Uh, An A, uh, after adjustment, four level two blocks. Here's one of the exciting things. And you always, you can see this sometimes when the the Ravens run a lot of run plays in one game. They ran 46 times in this one. Bradley Bozeman, 13 out of 16 on pulls. 16 pulls in one football game. Yes, uh, I completely agree. Bozeman was outstanding, especially with the level of competition. He was out in front of the majority, paving the way for the majority of Gus Edwards' gas runs on those dive plays. Very effective with the pulls for sure. All right. Matt Skura, a little bit more difficulty. Now, Matt Skura, we went through this game, and he was having an outstanding game until the very last drive. I don't have it exactly right here. No, until the last two drives, really, until quarter four. And then he uh, he gave up half a sack on the last play of quarter three, had a holding penalty early in quarter four, and then had pressure on the last drive. But he ended up with a D for the day. Um, but he was really looking great for three quarters. One of the, oh, Sorry, a C- minus for the day, C- minus after adjustment. Ten level two blocks. So in the with the Steelers four-man front alignment, a lot of times he was the guy to release off his double team into level two. He did a really good job of making those blocks there, of not missing. Uh, only had four misses on the day, so ten out of whatever uh, is terrific in level two. Um, he had three highlight combination blocks among those. So I thought there was a lot positive to take from Skura's game that kind of got ruined by that holding call. I don't know about you, Voss. I kind of thought that holding call was a little ticky-tack relative to what we've seen called this year. Definitely ticky-tack. As soon as the, uh, the the tackle crossed, he released. Fortunately, the Ravens did cash in with the touchdown later on in that drive. Skura, he occasionally he has trouble anchoring against those big, big nose guards. Uh, or I guess defensive tackles when the uh, the defense is expecting a pass. And I think that's something that the Ravens have hid very well and, and protected their offensive linemen. But when they are forced into that situation, occasionally there are uh, some vulnerabilities are exposed. All right. I think Skur has had a pretty decent year so far. Uh, this is a little step back from where he'd been, but uh, honestly, it, it's been way above expectation for me in terms of coming back from that injury. Sure. All right. Tyree Phillips also put on IR today, so that means he'll be out for three weeks. Not wholly unexpected. Probably means Will Holden will be coming up, although I don't think they've made that move officially yet. Um, 14 plays in this game, 11 blocks. He allowed half a sack, half a penetration. He only scored seven points, but he does not get a grade for this game below because he's the below the 20 snap minimum. Uh, One interesting thing was he actually pulled on a play and gave up half a sack on it, which you really rarely see. But uh, but it was an interesting kind of a combination of of things there. Sad to lose Tyree for a period here. 
really opens up the question of who should play left guard and a right guard next uh, for the Ravens. Phillips definitely had a tough go up against Tuit early on there. Um, we will see when he comes back whether he can uh, reclaim that starting job or maybe he's going to become the swing tackle now after the injury to Stanley. You know, that's certainly a possibility. I think Will Holden is the obvious guy who gets that job right now off the practice squad, but you're right that Phillips may be the guy that they have to go to, particularly if Holden plays like Will Holden has played in the past with uh, his many other franchises he's been with. Uh, let's move on a little bit and go to go to Orlando Brown. Played the entire game first at right tackle, and he had a lot of difficulty early in this game with J.J. Watt. Uh, gave up. A quarterback hit on the interception. He was pressured again uh, by Watt on the fourth play of the game, then gave up another half a, a penetration on the sixth play of the game. You see where I'm going with this. Then he moved to left tackle, and he did not have a single negative event at left tackle the entire remainder of the game, which is remarkable. And just what the doctor ordered, frankly, for the Ravens' offense uh, he was the biggest single reason for the turnaround after Stanley's injury and still able to, to maintain a good run run offense. Uh, his adjust After adjustment, he scores at the bottom end of the A range for me, five blocks in level two, two pancakes. Uh, just a terrific game there of, of uh, getting it done on the left side after he moved. Agreed. And you have to wonder if the left side, maybe he's a little more comfortable there. He played there in college. Watts a tough matchup for anybody with that mm-hmm. speed, bending the edge there. But just also note that Orlando did have a nice down block on the Gus Edwards touchdown plunge. Yep. 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 Love. Love. That's Orlando's natural thing is to down block when he's mm-hmm. on the right edge, in particular the right handed run game. He has a down block on the defensive tackle, would let a player like Watt go in space, which, by the way, didn't work all that well in this game. They allowed Watt to, to run loose in space, and he did a good job of identifying whether – uh, uh, he made a better read on Jackson than Jackson was able to make on Watt in this game. Yep. All right. Moving over to Patrick McCary, next who next replaced Phillips at right guard. Played 64 snaps in this game. That is not – that's a full game's worth of work, no doubt about it. Seven misses in the game. One quarterback hit allowed and 1.5 sacks. 1.5 sacks, very very bad for a guard. Up against Stefan Tuitt, one of the things I really noticed is he's, his disadvantage in length showed up in spades. He's getting shed a lot, um, and he, he got pushed back a lot and on some very unfortunate times. And in particular, if you go back and look at the fourth and three uh, run by Jackson, where they're trying to, to extend the drive and score the go-ahead touchdown – he really got penetrated against by two at several yards in the backfield. Jackson had to curve around to it and then tripped over Skura's ankle. No fault of Skura's. If that lane is open, you know, it's a, it's a very easy first down, if not a touchdown for Lamar. Uh, and unfortunately that, that play got blown up by McCary's uh, failed block on to it. So deep plus on the game for, for uh, McCary who had five blocks in level two. I'm looking at PFFs grading and I, I frankly can, I don't understand what they're looking at. I, I scored the game completely different is all I will say on this matter. I did give three highlight blocks to McCary during this game. Nice highlight combination blocks. Uh, it wasn't like he didn't have his positive plays. It's just there's too many overwhelming negative plays in this game and, and ones of significance, frankly. I had the exact same note written down. The arm length disadvantage against two. It was evident to it was shutting him. More, more often than you'd like to see, reminiscent of uh, Jeffrey Simmons in the playoffs, actually. One of those other just big, long D tackles. McCary is a, a nice, capable backup, but I'm not sure if you want him starting with his limitations. Um, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see what they what they decide to do moving forward. All right, we have to talk about that in a minute. Uh, so let's make sure we come back to it. But Fluker is is the last guy I want to talk about. Came in, played 58 snaps at right tackle after Stanley was out, of course. And uh, he did allow one and a half pressures and one and a half quarterback hits. And I got to tell you, given Watt had five quarterback hits in this ball game and it's TJ Watt over there, that is a hell of a football game that that Fluker played. 46 and a half points with adjustment. He goes up to .88, which is just an identical score as Orlando Brown for the game at the bottom of the A range. 
four pancakes over there for Fluker. Very physical effort, obviously. He got into level two and made four blocks. Had a couple of really nice highlights. I believe both his highlights were cases where he had combinations on two defensive linemen, which is really rare to see, but it will tell you, you know, he's not having to move a whole lot to make effective combination blocks. Fluker played well, especially coming in cold off the bench. I think I have a reasonable amount of confidence in him manning the right side and Orlando on the left side going forward. I'm a little bit more concerned on the interior. He's not going to be a a dancing ballerina uh, pass blocker, but he's certainly a very strong run blocker. Well, there you go. Uh, Powers came in, made one block, uh, one one opportunity. That was on the touchdown run by Edwards. So uh, nothing to really go on on Powers, obviously, in this game. So we'll come back now to the question, boss. Is, is what do the Ravens do about right guard? Because they came back from the bye week. Phillips had the job again, which I don't think is unreasonable because I don't think he did enough to lose the job, especially when compared to what McCary had produced or even, frankly, what Powers has produced so far this year, even though I think Powers has been uh, you know, pretty good between this year and the end of last year in that Pittsburgh game. Right. That's the uh, the point. They, he played very well um, in Week 17 last year when the Ravens also were able to run the ball very effectively against a tough Steelers front. Personally, I'd like to see Powers have an opportunity here, uh, but obviously we don't know what goes on in the practice field and, and why he hasn't gotten that opportunity, considering they have a lot more draft uh, pedigree and, and capital invested into him. And he does have at least the, the, the length and the maybe the physical prowess maybe to, to to bolster, upgrade a little bit over what McCary can do. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think McCary honestly should be probably a backup center at this point. But you're, you're exactly right when you say, we, we haven't seen practice. And since we haven't really seen very much at all of Powers on the field, he's probably played, you know, what, less than 60 NFL snaps total, meaning less than a full game, even with that performance. It may, it may be less than 70 against the, against the Steelers. There's just not really enough to go on for us to make a claim that we really know who Ben Powers is as a starting right guard. But I would agree the length makes a big difference at that position when you're opening the front gate. I want to see a guy who's longer and can do more to get to the jersey and the armpits of that opposing defensive tackle and give you a better chance to turn him than McCary, who's who's frankly like Joe Frazier playing against Muhammad or you know trying to get inside on Muhammad Ali every single ta- uh, you know defensive tackle he faces. Yeah, so we'll see what they do moving forward. They're, they're- must be something going on behind the scenes here, but a lot of the the Ravens offensive line gurus, including yourself and some of the others, uh, Cole and Spencer, they uh, they seem to be in agreement. Let's let's give Powers a chance here, but we'll see we'll see how they play it. All right, I think that's uh, that's pretty much all we can say. You mentioned the Steelers, you know, basically have been beaten now twice in a row uh, for, by the running game of the Ravens. Now they didn't lose both games. They lost a game that was going to potentially get them in the playoffs last year and gave up, I think it was 223 yards rushing in that game, 265 in this game. That is a historic number against the Pittsburgh Steelers. You have to go back to 1993, the last time any team ran for 265. That was 267 by the Seahawks 27 years ago. Since 1975, and I was a kid, I watched the 75-76 Steelers. They're just unbelievable defense. Um, they've only given up 200 and 50 plus rushing yards on three total occasions, this being the third. Uh, the Ravens seem to have their number. Uh, it, obviously, they were mushing, missing Bush, their inside backer, um, but uh, the Ravens are, were using backups in both of these performances. Lamar didn't even play in week 17. And I don't know if it's the familiarity because it is a similar front to what they use in practice versus some of the other teams they play but they seem to be able to run the ball very effectively against the Steelers, no matter how highly the defense is rated. Yeah. It's interesting. The uh, uh, guest I had on know your foe was, was, you know, very optimistic about the Steelers chances with their over front and the chance to, uh, you know, stop the Ravens and the Steelers had the second best run defense in the entire NFL coming into the game in terms of yards per game. Only, I think it's only Tampa Bay had given up fewer, but uh, uh, definitely a, a, a a really good performance that gives you some hope. And in a way, I think the Ravens may have found their identity or refound their identity with this performance as far as being able to uh, go out there and uh, run the ball 
more look to get 10 yards on four downs the way they did with Lamar as a rookie and Lamar in 2019 uh, obviously added a, a, a large passing wrinkle to that. But uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, boss. No, I definitely agree with that. This Obviously, the Ravens lost the game. It was a disappointing game. It sets them back in the playoff chase. But there were certainly signs to be encouraged about the running game. No question is one of them. Um, when you outgain a team by this many yards, you expect to win. And although they didn't win, they weren't the better team at the end on the scoreboard. They were the better team in a lot of ways. Yeah, they were. They were definitely the better team on the field, even though they, they you know, they lost some high leverage plays. And and you know what? One, the drive I find really impressive is the one where the Ravens got the ball with seven twenty nine remaining. Mm-hmm. And just to go through that, it was all run. Uh, Run, run left for seven, run right for four, run left for nine, run middle for five, run left for 20, run right for 15, run up the middle for three, run right, run up the middle for two, run up the middle for two, run up the middle for two. And unfortunately, that came up a yard short. But they just jammed it down Pittsburgh's throat. There weren't any penalties. There weren't any passes. There's no excuses for what happened, really, from the from the Pittsburgh point of view. They just The Ravens ran for four first downs in a period of six plays. And uh, really, just ran them right off the field in, in uh, on that drive, and they they got it down to two minutes at that point. I mean, it was almost the point we were there that that you know people all around us were saying that they're scoring too quick. They need to slow this down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, reminiscent of, of uh, 2019, it really was to to be able to have those long extended drives and to be effective on the ground and little little rain and weather. In a lot of ways, it was just not the end result that we wanted. Uh, that's for sure. All right. Uh, anything else about the offensive line we need to hit on before? I think we've got everything there. Let's move on. Let's talk about Lamar Jackson a little bit. I uh, clearly had one of his worst games as a Raven. Now, I think he came out. It's, it's two fumbles lost, but I don't know how many fumbles they actually tagged him for in the game because he had one fumble after he was down. He had another fumble where he picked it up himself immediately. Uh, it was a bad game for holding on to the football. Fourth down, there was a fourth down where he fumbled at the end. That that exact that same fourth down on that second to last drive that uh, he lost it on fourth down, so it didn't make a difference. Right. Besides the strip from uh, from Dupree, the strip sack. Right, and and he had he he did not lose the ball out of bounds. Actually, Andrews lost the ball out of bounds on a reception. Mm-hmm. Uh, but obviously, a, a, a disappointing game in terms of holding on to the football. Probably a more disappointing game in terms of having the right touch on a couple of passes. The Spillane interception, the pick six, the, which is the first of his career, uh, really was just missing the linebacker, not not picking him up properly, which is very un Lamar like. Obviously, he hasn't thrown a lot of pick sixes, and that's how they happen. But to have that happen on that, you know, the, what the second or third offensive play was just awful. When I first, obviously, the game ended. With the emotions running high, I thought this was clearly Lamar's worst game as a professional by far. And the two interceptions were absolutely awful. Uh, the second one might have been worse. And the worst part about them was they just totally flipped momentum the worst possible time, the first drive of the game and the first drive of the second half. Um, however, upon further review, second watch, if you take those two throws out, I actually think he played B, B, B plus football. Believe it or not. Okay, so I- including the fumbles, you inc- you you would agree. Well, the this fumble, the first fumble, I don't think was really his fault. Um, nobody was open. He was waiting. They had uh, Andrews totally blanketed, and the uh, Dupree came from behind him and knocked the ball out while he was trying to throw it. The second fumble was a fourth down run where Skurl was held up and he couldn't quite get there, just trying to make a play. And the other near interception, which I think we're going to get to, but I don't necessarily believe that was his fault either. Are we talking about that's the Hayden interception that with went Boykin. to the ground? Yeah, with yep. Boykin. Because it looked like Boykin was slow coming out of his break and was ready to just sit down there in front of Hayden and use his body to screen the ball. And then he kept going, took another two steps, and then that's where Hayden jumped the route. And then if you looked at Lamar's body, he was waving at Boykin afterwards like, you know, what's going on here? It was a miscommunication, I think. Right. Obviously, that's a that's a big, serious trust problem between those two, and it's something that they've had trouble building as it, as it was. You can see in the scripted plays, they're trying to do more to build Lamar's connection with other receivers. They had the 14-yard throw to Boykin early was definitely a scripted play. Then Lamar made a fantastic throw in the edge of the end zone, which is, by the way, the only place 
where he seems to be comfortable with who Miles Boykin is, mm-hmm. is, is in the end zone. And, you know, I look back at the Miami game last year when he had the touchdown, that was a, you know, thrown up with two back shoulders that he, that he saw the defenders, the Cleveland game was a quick turnaround where he had to trust Boykin to come out of that break properly. He did. Uh, and then the, the jets game, he made space and made, and, 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 and Boykin also made complimentary space in the right side of the end zone. This game was just a, it was a perfectly thrown pass. Boykin didn't do anything special. I didn't think on the route, he just ran it normally, Mm -hmm. but it, it required a perfect pass from Lamar. I mean, if you go throw for throw, I think Lamar missed, maybe four or five throws throughout the game. There was another incompletion in the fourth quarter that Andrews just stopped yes. running, and that's more on Andrews. The one play, I think, maybe was the last play where he just totally stared down Sneed, and it looked like Andrews was uncovering about two yards away from him if he would have held it for another second. All right. I'll have to go back and look at that one myself. Jackson's metrics a little bit different um, in this game. 2.87 seconds average time to throw. By the way, that compares to 2.19 from Roethlisberger in this game. Roethlisberger just was all about getting rid of the ball immediately to get it out of his hands and beat the Ravens pass rush. But the uh, the 2.87 for Lamar is actually pretty high league-wide. It might be a seventh or eighth highest in the league this week, but it's shorter still than his season average, which is uh, very close to three seconds still. One that, The one stat that was really good, and you mentioned some good things that happened during the game, 10.7 completed air yards. The average was the highest and the best in the entire NFL. And he, he had a positive air yard differential, which means his completed yards were longer than his intended yards. Folks, that almost never happens because you always complete short passes uh, to running backs, much higher completion percentage on those than you do on your bombs. And so you almost always come back with a uh, a lower completed, uh, sorry, yeah, completed air yards than intended air yards than completed air yards. Sorry, lower completed than intended. He didn't really uh, throw it downfield very much besides uh, DuVernay and maybe a couple times to Snead. But it was it was pretty effective. He just could have take took away those those turnovers. Yeah. Yeah. Just could take away those turnovers. <laughs> if, if, you know, minus twelve point four percent completion percentage over expectation. It, it's, I, I, we've been over on this show the, the the weaknesses in that statistic, but I but in this particular case, I don't think it's necessarily a terrible reflection of what went on. In particular, a couple of the interceptions uh, really should have been either a completion or, or a, a not interception, but the, uh, uh, he, he did have a, a throw or two. The Andrews, the Andrews play that you talked about is one that it was, he was over maybe between the numbers and left hash and Andrews had broken over fairly deep and the throw was massively underthrown. I don't think it was on Andrews to come back for that ball. I'm, That's I'm what re- I'm talking about. Okay. I'm referring to a different play. Uh, I think it was the second to last drive or maybe even the last drive where Andrews was kind of wide open in the middle of the field, just stopped and Lamar was leading him a little bit. Oh, okay. I have to go back and look at that one then too. All right. Uh, interceptable balls, obviously a problem in this one with three. And, uh, and again, I, I, I need to look at that boy can throw again and really see who I blame it on. Cause I, I, I didn't note down in, in my, uh, you know, production notes here that we needed to talk about about the Boykin trust situation and whether that had been broken with, uh, uh, you know, what happened on the break on that route. I don't yeah. talk, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I'm not trying to defend Lamar too much. Uh, I just uh, – they lost this game because of Lamar, in my opinion, but I don't think they would have been in this game to any extent either without Lamar. So some of the, uh, the Lamar bashing is a little bit overboard, in my opinion. Right. Well, from a scheme perspective, Lamar definitely drove the run game as he did in 18 and 19 in terms of the ability to uh, force the defense to consider him first. And it just worked out extremely well. Um, it, why don't we talk about that next? Because I thought uh, that was one of the really good things and the positive precursors for the rest of the season is how the Ravens really went back to the pistol in this game as their primary run weapon. 25 times they ran out of the pistol in this t- in this uh, game. At first, by the way, there was uh, we have Edwards and Dobbins kind of alternating in terms of their time in the backfield. And Edwards was getting 100% of the pistol runs early and and Dobbins was getting 100% of the sidecar runs. But then it, it, it changed, and Dobbins had plenty of pistol runs for the game. In fact, he had 12 of the 25, as it turned out, for the whole game. Uh, and Edwards had four of the 14 sidecars. So it, it wasn't any kind of a huge 
uh, uh, differential in the end. But but it was kind of uh, interesting to see that you know start to develop. The pistol just has been the effective weapon. It's been the thing that really no one has been able to figure out without making very big compromises elsewhere on the field. Yeah, the, I think Greg Roman put the bye week to good use, getting back to the pistol. Another nice wrinkle that he uh, brought in was the option pitch, not the read option, mm-hmm. but where they was actually pitching it. I think they had two two Dobbins early in the third quarter and then a two one or two more in the fourth quarter. Very effective. Um, just continuing to build upon that the complexities of that run that run game. Yeah, this is the right game to add plays when you have a big important divisional game. It's just sad the Ravens didn't win it, but you know he's he's been a master Roman of out surprising the opponent, always having some new wrinkle he's adding to try and uh, give the playbook more depth and texture to to defend. Uh, anyway. Uh, very positive, obviously, on what happened in the run game. One of the things we saw that was kind of interesting was on on the Edwards TD run. Edwards is a fullback in the pony backfield, which we've only seen, I think, one other time this year. Uh, I may be wrong on that. I know who can tell me. Uh, but, uh, but the pony backfield, uh, an interesting – call there an interesting choice there that forced the the uh, uh Steelers to try and determine who was going to get the football certainly I'll have to go back and check that one out myself but uh, the more you can add I, the uh QB option or I'm sorry the QB draw I thought they used that effectively but maybe a little bit too much at certain points we have, we're seeing a lot of Lamar's runs come up the middle this mm-hmm. year. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I'm afraid they're going to lose in Ronnie Stanley is the ability to run left with Lamar. Cause it was, that's something that he's exceptional in terms of sealing that edge and his feet are good to do it. I kind of question whether Orlando Brown's going to be able to do the same things. Um, we talked about Boykin a little bit earlier too. Let's talk about that first. And, and I do want to make a point about Boykin here as well. Anything else you have to say about the about the left edge and concerns with Lamar running left or or runs left in general? Um, we'll see. We'll see. I think the left is actually going to. It depends what happens at right guard. Yeah, I know they're a right-handed team and Fluker's very strong over there. But now you have Bozeman and Brown on the left side, so I think they'll be okay on the left side. Okay. All right. Um, uh, you know, our, our guest on the last show or on one of the recent shows said. He was done hearing about how good a, a, a run blocker that Miles Boykin was. But Miles <laughs> Boykin had some tremendous run blocks in this game on the long runs. Uh, one on Lamar's long run, another one. He's in the picture the whole time. He never releases his man uh, on Dobbins' long mm-hmm. run where he keeps you know dribbling up the right sideline. No one seems to be able to either knock him out or bring him down. Uh, both, both great blocks, and those weren't his only ones. Absolutely. No question. Uh, he and and Boyle and Ricard all, all blocked very well in this game, I thought. Yeah, R- Ricard now, they only they used him relatively scantily in this game, but he was terrific when he was in there in terms of his effect on the on the run game. Uh, I want to say he only played maybe 17 snaps in this game. And I looked at the game book total earlier. I got to bring it up again here for myself, but uh, uh, I believe that's correct. That's right, 17 snaps from a card. But but I agree. I thought he was terrific in terms of his blocks. And he was really feeling it on the field, really letting you know uh, how he felt about the blocks he had made. Mm-hmm. And I think they need that on offense. They need some of that uh, testosterone a little bit sometimes. <laughs> That's good to hear. <laughs> uh, some of the other you know scheme things uh, – the Duvernay, the big off-script opportunity, I'm pretty happy about. Um, and he, if, for one thing, he was up to 37 snaps in this game. They threw mm-hmm. the ball to him three times, and the one that was completed was the was the bomb down the middle of the field, which was an off-script play, uh, clearly. It was, a, it was a fairly late read uh, that they got the ball to him, and, and there's no one anywhere near him. Yeah, it was a great play. He lined up in the slot, and uh... – I'd like to. I'd love to see Duvernay get more involved. He seems to be a playmaker. He really is. Um, and he actually outsnapped Boykin in this game, forty-five percent to forty percent, according to uh, SIS. I'm not sure exactly how you charted it, 
But coming out of the bye, you need to get the rookie more involved and continue to build him up into the offense, I think. Yeah, it's, it's hard to miss snap count, so I'm sure you're right about that. But I want to check it right now because I, I did not notice it. Uh, but you're right, 37 to 33 in snaps. That's, uh, that's how it was. But uh, I, <laughs> that, is, that is a pretty big change that maybe has gone a little bit under the radar given the nature of all the Ravens news that's come out over the last 48 hours. But uh, that's a pretty darn big change. Yep. So hopefully they can continue uh, getting more and more touches for DuVernay. I think they're going to need it down the stretch. Okay, another another scheme thing I want to mention, which leads into one of the other points, is the fade route they threw to Hollywood in the end zone. Now, this is the one where they had the review. They, they you know, it, it appeared uh, he might have been close to tapping two feet down, but it didn't. Then it didn't appear he got it. And then they came back to him for a more traditional rollout and throw to an open area from Lamar, where Lamar was really creating the passing lane with his legs. But I want to talk about that fade route for a minute because the Ravens basically do not throw any fade route touchdowns they, they just other teams they use the fade out in the red zone and you talk about a big player being a red zone threat now i'm not saying they never throw the ball high and try and make use of andrew's size in the end zone for example mm-hmm. but it's basically uh, they they create passing lanes with lamar's legs to get a direct on a line throw uh that beats the traffic as opposed to trying to beat a single quarterback over the top well, fade routes one of the uh, least effective red zone plays, I believe, by most metrics. And that was a the touchdown, the bootleg right, and then it was almost like an option route where Hollywood just had to find space and mm-hmm. sucked up the uh, the linebacker there, and, and Lamar hit him. And that, I think that was Hollywood's only catch, right? Yeah, only catch, three yards in the game. And, you know, again, of course, that led to the Twitter outburst afterwards, and you know, I hear a lot of things about this. I'm glad, first of all, I'm glad the tweet was already deleted, but I, I'm unhappy that it ever occurred. And I don't think it'll win him any um, um, points with his teammates. Yeah, I agree. Um, wide receivers want the ball, but uh, I guess I can understand a little bit more coming after a loss. If they had won the game, that's a certain no no. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting. He hasn't been fed the ball as much. And we obviously know he and Lamar are are very close and they, they drive to the game together, I believe. And, uh, but he, he had a hard time getting off of coverage. There wasn't, there was a few coverage sacks where nobody was open, including Hollywood. So you can't force him the ball in that situation. Right. I, I agree. Um, you know, they, and they didn't, they're not scripting plays for Hollywood in this particular game because they needed to try and build up, you know, relationships between Lamar and other players, which may be part of the problem. And in fact, the Spillane pick six early in that game was also the first NFL target for James Prochet. Mm-hmm. So it, it's, uh, you know, he had not got a target in his first one as a pick six. So. Uh, that's a bummer. I, I don't really blame Prochet for any part of that. I, I, I'm not sure that, that uh, there was a way he could have come back for the ball. I think it really is mostly on, on Lamar's field vision. Agreed. Agreed. All right. Well, this is the part of the show where we usually kind of go back and forth on some other players we haven't talked about so far. Uh, you know, if there's anybody you'd like to bring up that you don't think we've talked about enough, let's let's do it and let's kind of go back and forth, do one each, and then each get a chance to respond. Sure, Willie Sneed. I think if the Ravens had won this game, he would be right up there with the MVP. Uh, one of his best games ever as a Raven, almost a vintage 2018 Willie Sneed performance, where he was really known as a third down chain mover. He actually was up near, I think, top 10 in the league as far as third down conversions that season. And he hasn't been involved in the offense very much, but he, it was great to see him involved here. And he made some great plays and tremendous yards after the catch, run after the catch. Yeah, very good. Very, very powerful running after the catch. You know, he, he had a little bit of a bad run there, caught five of seven in this game, though. And now he's up to 16 of 22 for the year, 70. 72.7%, which is excellent for a wide receiver. Uh, it, it's just what you want is a, is a high percentage catch rate, a guy who throws everything and catches everything he's supposed to. In this game, I thought he really found the seams in the zone very effectively, the holes in the zone, 
and uh, made himself available to Lamar in a way that Lamar could read easily. Yeah, that's that's Willie's game. He 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 dominates against zone coverage often. Um, so yeah, good to see. You. Continue to build on it. Um, you want to go next? Sure, I'd go with. Uh, well, let's talk about Dobbins and Edwards since they're mm-hmm. obviously the big tandem uh, comparison here. I thought you know a lot of things went well about this game. These guys all have both have good short area vision. Uh, Edwards being a you know a taller back uh, has has I think probably a little bit better field vision in terms of the, the the longer sense. Dobbins is more of an elusive in the short area guy. But I thought both guys showed that good field vision in this game. They made the most out of their level two opportunities, which is huge. Mm-hmm. And Dobbins is racking up yards after contact this year. He's now at the 4.2 yards per run after contact. Now, a lot of backs don't average 4.2 yards per play. <laughs> he's he's 4.2 yards per play after contact, and, and that's really been remarkable. Yes, Gus was tremendous, um, but Dobbins really, really stood out. Just his – he has incredible balance. He had – I think it was his first long run where he looked like he was about to go down on the right sideline and then somehow kept his balance. And he breaks a lot of tackles in tight quarters, which is uh, not a lot of running backs can do to make guys miss two and three guys within a, a yard or two of each other. I had him down for eight uh, forced missed tackles in this game, and that's outstanding. Most running backs are pretty much interchangeable, but when they can start forcing missed tackles, that's how they really add value. Yeah, that's that that would be outstanding. I mean, that's uh, I, I I I know there's various sources on missed tackles. I honestly don't trust any of them unless I do the charting. But I, if you if you say he had eight uh, missed tackles in this game, I like your your number, and I think qualitatively it, it sounds correct to me. Uh, it, he's been one of the most impressive breakaway runners. You mentioned his ability to keep his balance. He's very Ray Rice like, and he has the exact same hold the ball in his right arm, go down with his left arm. And mm-hmm. keep himself up on three pins. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, he can keep himself up on a tripod and then keep moving. Uh, that's been fun to watch, and and really, I think so far is is uh, very much justified the draft pick. Agreed. Agreed. Who's your next guy? Uh, those were really the main the main guys that stood out to me. We already touched on uh, Rackard Boyle, as you said, Rackard. He- just setting the edge and sealing the edge. He looked like an offensive tackle in a couple plays out there. Um, but uh, I think we covered most of, most of the people on my list. Okay. Um, how about how about Boyle? Because I thought he had a good game helping to establish those double teams uh, in the middle and on the edge. Uh, and he had kind of a, an additional level of responsibility given what's going on at the ta- in the tackle situation to make sure that he's getting some movement on his block. Yes, absolutely. And I think in certain matchups – um, for Fluker, he's going to need a little help from Boyle going forward. But yes, certainly Boyle was a very strong blocker in this game. He's he's very consistent week to week. All right, we're not going to have any MVPs this week because we don't do that after a loss. So that's just a unfortunate circumstance. There are a lot of players who played well offensively and a lot of players who played well defensively. Honestly, the the focus of this loss comes down, uh, you know, pretty squarely, frankly, on on the turnovers that were uh, were largely Lamar. Uh, Josh, what do you have for us in the mailbag? All right, just a little bit in the mailbag today. I was excited. About, I was going to bring you the Hollywood uh, Brown question as a mailbag question, but you guys already covered that. Um, and I think for a lot of fans, what that the way they took that tweet is if it didn't affect his relationship with the players, it made us feel a little bit more comfortable about not having Antonio Brown. Yes. um, You know, you said earlier about, you know, the wide receiver is a diva position. They want the football. If they don't, not getting the football, they feel uninvolved in the game. Uh, You know, I think it's unfortunate that he's got the um, familial relationship he's got but it almost forces him to be more careful on social media with who he is. You know, people are always going to project Antonio's behavior onto Hollywood. It's completely unfair, um, but it, but it is what it is. And, and, you know, you, you hope that Hollywood can avoid those same stigmas throughout his career that, that Antonio now has. Yeah, that's well said. It wouldn't be the worst idea in the world to get him a touch early in the game. You know, you like to get your running backs in rhythm. Maybe you get Hollywood – 
as you said, you script a touch for him early in the game just to get him involved going forward. But I also think that that type of tweet, which is something that one of us wouldn't send, is more something for the younger superstar kid. Like I could see Lamar Jackson having that same type of attitude, so it might not rub him the right way. How much of that, of Hollywood not being in this game early, has to do with Lamar not being consistent downfield? I think I think honestly more of it was the scripting of plays early and the scripting of the passes early in this game that that there was an overwhelming need to get more players involved in the passing game. So they, they set up a, a pass to Prochet, which went drastically wrong. They set up a pass early to Boykin. Uh, you know, they had passes to Sneed early in the game where they're trying to obviously beat the zone. Uh, it just did not have their standard. Uh, set of Andrews and Hollywood only routes. Andrews, I mean, only had what six targets for 32 in this game. That's a low total for him. So, uh, you know, it's it was the primary guys, despite a very large offensive snap total for the Ravens, didn't get a lot of targets. All right. Um, were you surprised that the Ravens didn't make any moves today before the trade deadline? I think they probably tried. But, you know, one of the things happening is I think the, the breaking COVID story may have some implications for the team's decision making going forward. Obviously, this is a very serious situation. If this persists for two or even three weeks, it could be very scary in terms of what it means for the Ravens season. I said entering these five games that they're sure to make the playoffs. These five games would just really determine their seeding. Now I'm not 100 percent as sure. And to add on to that and. I thought if they were going to make a move, it was probably going to be for a defensive back because even yes. before even before Humphrey uh, contracted the virus. Uh, also, the Stanley injury, I think, changes maybe the equation slightly. It, it may not be the time to push all in to maybe these, the ceiling of the team is slightly lower, and they have already given up a third-round draft pick for Ngakwe. So uh, – I, maybe if you would ask me this time last week, I would be more surprised. But what's happened since it, it makes it makes some sense. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. So you get information and you don't go all in on the hand this year. And you know, this is a team which has still a lot of cap space next year. They have a lot of of um, you know, contracts coming due that they're going to have to get signed. But they also have a lot of space relative to other NFL teams. And if they if they kill off their their draft capital and they kill off their their cap. Uh, next year, the advantages they have, it'll be really the last open year of the window, the last easy open year where Lamar's not making a ton of money. All right. So uh, Minion Hunter was really upset that the Ravens got called on a offensive holding penalty on Sunday. Um, do you think the refs had much of an impact in this game? <laughs> and the, the big play to really talk about would be the play at the end of the game and if there should have been a flag or if they should have just let it walk off. I mean, I thought the end of the game should have been a flag. I thought he got there early, but I thought the pass interference on Bonds was fairly ticky-tack. Uh, the pass interference on Humphrey, I have not yet reviewed in all 22, but what they showed us on the broadcast was nothing that would I would consider pass interference. Uh, the offensive holding we talked about earlier, Voss, I don't think that, uh, you know, I think that was fairly ticky-tack by 2020 standards. I'm bothered in, in a sense by the illegal formation penalty because I don't know when they're going to call it. I, you know, I just, <laughs> you know, it's it seems to happen an awful lot and they just don't call it all the time. Um, I thought the Peters uh, penalty was, was ticky-tack. I thought that they whistled the Dobbins stopped instead of letting him get out of bounds late in the fourth quarter, which I don't know if I've ever seen happen before, which would have saved maybe five, 10 seconds on the clock. And uh, Judon getting thrown out for what in my mind was incidental contact. Uh, he wasn't, it, it was almost Suggs in Detroit type of uh, type of deal. Um, uh, you can't blame it on the refs. You, you blame it on the turnovers, but I thought that the Pittsburgh probably got the better, better deal of the officiating in this game. And of, and of course you both uh, did not bring up the extra seconds with the injured Steeler. Yeah, that was, at a, the end. that was a problem. I mean, the league has come out about that uh, steroid, not the league, but, uh, but that was a big problem the, behind the play that not to be uh, thrown out. I actually did think that the Dobbins play, the correct call was for the clock to continue running for the record Voss. So okay. the, the, the fact that they spotted there, he was actually being moved backwards. That's when you call it. 
uh, when the when the when the player's being moved backwards and goes out of bounds. So he has to still be moving forwards. Uh, but that that was ridiculous behind the play. Cam Hayward being down, right? Just just didn't make any sense at all. And I thought ten seconds, you know, would have given the Ravens three and perhaps four chances to get into the end zone from there, which would have made it a lot more interesting. Right, and of course the Peters play you mentioned was a bad call, but then he immediately got the strip and fumble. There you go. So we all got past that right away. All right, um, how's this offensive line move forward now without Stanley? I know you addressed it some, but are you happy with the guys we have in order to do this, or is it more like Vaz was saying about we're now just kind of looking to next year to have a good offensive line? Do you want to start with this, Vaz? Well, I don't think I'm looking to next year to have an offensive line. I actually still think the Ravens have the makings of a solid offensive line, even without Stanley. There's a lot of teams around the league in much worse shape. Uh, Just look at the entire NFC uh, East division, for example. Um, So I think they're going to be okay. I just I think they need to figure out right guard, potentially make a move there. Yeah, I I agree. I think that the identity of the team – uh, as a running team that appeared to be generated in this football game, they need to build on that. And and that means use Brown and use Fluker at what they're really good at. Brown and Fluker were absolutely outstanding in this game at left tackle and right tackle, respectively. Most of the, the, the downgrades at all for Brown, of course, were on the right side. So I, I just I think there's reason for hope coming out of this game against such a good pair of bookend um, you know, def- defensive ends, outside linebackers, that y- you would have, you know, positive views of what the, what the Ravens can be offensively the rest of the year. They just need to build on that identity, I think, now. All right, and that leads right into this final question. Not to say that the team is bad because the Chiefs and the Steelers are the two best teams in football, and that's who you got your two losses to. But with Super Bowl expectations, they're going to have to beat both of these teams. What do you build on in order to do that the next time you play them? I mean, in terms of how do you beat the Steelers the next time, you do exactly what you did this time, and you just don't turn the ball over. That's that's the that's the simple answer on that. It, the <laughs> right. much harder answer is how do you beat the Chiefs? Uh, well, you could say catch the ball against the Chiefs or against the against the against the Steelers. We're talking about. Well, the Chiefs we had a lot of drops. Uh, Chiefs, we had a lot of coverage breakdowns too. So was, there was the, the problems were much worse and much, much more inability to do a lot of things right. They got beat a lot worse than the thirty-four twenty score would indicate. But but I'm I'm uh, I'm optimistic actually relative to their ability to beat Pittsburgh. Bring them on in the playoffs, even there. A thousand percent, a thousand percent against Pittsburgh. Uh, another rematch, and I think Tennessee uh, is the other, and Buffalo. I think the Ravens match up well, but but KC. KC's maybe on a different level. I'm not as confident in that matchup. And we didn't mention this before so far, but there might be a 16, expansion to a 16-team playoff from 14. That's been been um, proposed today. I don't know why it's really necessary, and I'm not sure that it will happen. Um, they said it's a response to COVID. Well, they already went to 14 teams. I mean, you know, that seems to – would the Ravens potentially benefit from that? And if they did, they would get in as an eight seed, and then they play Kansas City right away, which doesn't sound like a good deal. But if they could, they otherwise benefit from it. Um, I think avoiding Kansas City would be the uh, the most beneficial tact. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Well, that does it for the mailbag. Um, I guess other than yeah, I, I checked. Uh, Santander did not win the Gold Glove tonight. It went to Joey Gallo. <laughs> so all the all the all the votes are in, and Joey Gallo won that. In case you were holding up for that. Um, Ken, what's coming up? We've got a by the numbers on Friday, but tomorrow we've got a Know Your Foe episode. No. Looking forward to this game that we think will still be Sunday. Right, Zach Hicks. So we'll we'll talk about that, but we'll mostly talk about uh, who the Colts personnel is. The Colts are having a good year. They're a very good defensive team, and they're particularly good against the run. We've heard that one before, Steelers fans. But anyway, we'll uh, uh, we'll see how that plays out in Indianapolis and. Uh, hopefully the Ravens can get back on track despite this enormous slug of defensive players they might be missing. All right. And then today I got this uh, film study sample shirt in. So we've got some film study shirts now up on the uh, filmstudybaltimore.com. And and they sent me one of these gators to test out, which is pretty nice. I don't know if either of you guys are one of these gator people. No, instead that of does the normal look nice. Mask, but the film study gator, I'm very impressed with. 
I haven't tried put, a Gator. Put it on for a second. I know more. it's going to mess up your mic here, but go ahead and put it on. And I just want to see how it looks on you. It definitely improves your look right there if you keep it over your face, Josh. You knew that yeah, was coming. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess I don't need my little pop filter, but it's a nice little Gator yeah. mask. Yeah, I do. I like it. If you're, in, if you're into that. But, uh, Voss, what's going on with you? What's up at Baltimore Beatdown? Baltimore Beatdown, we're just continuing to uh, build up our community. Or, and we write a lot of articles on various topics, uh, BaltimoreBeatdown.com. We have a nice community over there, and we're all following the season together. Okay, great, great place to go. And it's usually commenting on articles. I, I find it – you guys don't have a true message board, right, in that sense? It's you have to kind of comment on other people's comments, or how does it work exactly? Right. Each article um, basically has its own comment section or message board per article, which which is really attracting me to the site because there's a lot of good interaction and back and forth, but it's more topical. Um, so I, I enjoy that. We had a a couple of weeks before, or I guess a week and a half ago, we, I did the uh, trade. What, what should we have uh, or the ranking the Ravens trade needs, which was mm-hmm. uh, very uh, before, you know, everything changes now a week and a half later, but uh, nice, a nice blossoming conversation there. Oh, that's great. I'll take, I'll make sure I take a look at that. That's uh want to mention our own message board, by the way, Tom K, if you're out there listening to this, Thank you for all your comments. I'm going to I'm going to try and respond to them one by one, but I just wanted to call you out on the show as somebody who's been using the comment section over there. And if you would, folks, please feel free to comment on my content as well. Love to hear it and I will respond to you, I promise. All right. Well, that will do it for today's film study. We will talk to you guys soon. Hey.